Hello everyone and welcome to Imperial Lakes Online where we take a particular topic and explore it with researchers from Imperial College London and some of our friends from elsewhere. So this week's Lakes is all about how science is helping us understand and improve our mental and physical well-being. And tonight we're mashing up art and science to explore how the world around us affects our mental well-being in particular. So to do this we're going to be creating abstract expressionist cityscapes with artist Thatcher Patel, and as we go along, discuss the impact of our environment on our mental health with the lovely Rhiannon Thompson, a researcher here at Imperial College London. Before they introduce themselves, just a couple of things to mention. Firstly, please feel free to make what you're creating your own. We'll be guiding you through some activities, but ultimately you can create whatever it is you like. Whatever you're creating, we always love to see pictures of your work on social media. So please do tag us using hashtag Imperial Lates if you're posting and we'll make sure we have a good look as we go along. Daksha and Rhiannon would also love to answer your questions as we go or hear your comments. So please do post this in the chat. I'll be in the chat too, you'll see me, but I'll be called Imperial College London and I'll be passing on questions to Daksha and Rhiannon and responding to your comments and generally making sure everyone's okay. Please just be mindful when you're posting that you're respectful of others and I'll just be removing people who are disruptive, explicit or offensive in any way. Lastly, and really importantly, we are talking about mental health this evening. So if anything we discuss here resonates with you and you want to speak to an expert about your own personal experiences or mental health, the NHS have collected a really good range of services and various organisations um, that they offer and others offer that might be helpful. And we'll post a little link in the chat with that too. So let's get started. I'm really excited tonight to introduce you to the wonderful Daksha, who's going to tell us a little bit more about herself and introduce Rhiannon. So have a great time and over to you, Daksha. Hello, everyone. So I'm Daksha and I'm a visual artist. I work across a variety of different media, including animation, installation, textiles, printmaking, and drawing. And my subject matter is often scientific, uh, so I'm interested in scientific systems of mapping, visualizing, and measuring the human body and its relationship to the environment. And today, I'm going to be in conversation with Rhiannon Thompson, a researcher at Imperial who is investigating the impact of pollution on young people's mental health. Over to you, Rhiannon. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. So as Dax just said, I'm a PhD researcher at Imperial and I'm looking at the relationship between the physical environment and young people's mental health. So mostly that involves looking at exposure to things like noise and air pollution and how that links to mental health outcomes. But I'm also interested in the kind of indirect effects of young people's thoughts and feelings around the environment and how that could make them feel. So I do a kind of a mix of qualitative and quantitative work. Um, just to let you know, I'll be participating in the workshop. So if I'm looking down, I'm not like on my phone or doing something else, I'm taking part. Um, and I'd be quite interested to hear how the ways in which you feel like your environments affect your well-being um, and affect you. So if you put that in the comments, I'd be really interested to hear. And so what we'll be doing today, Daksha? So in this workshop, we will be drawing and making a collage. And here are some materials that you will need. And um, don't worry if you don't have all of them. Pencils or black markers are fine. If you have colored felt tips or pencils or pastels, you can use them too. I'll start by demonstrating some simple mark making exercises and then we will cut out shapes and collage them together to create a cityscape such as this one. Um, next slide. Or um, we can create a calm and uh, lovely oasis, green oasis in the city, uh, which you will see in a minute. That's the next <laughs> slide. <laughs> yeah, technical. Yeah, it takes time for the slides to come up. But basically, yeah, so that's the cityscape. It's kind of trying to um, explore what it feels like to be in a stressful, polluted um, kind of environment. So it's quite sort of visually busy and angular. And then in contrast to that, we have a kind of calmer. So we have the greens and the blues of a kind of park or an oasis, a lake in the middle of the city. So you can choose which one you would like to make. But initially, uh, I'd ask you to try and generate, if you can, about between five and 10 sheets of paper with these different textures that I'm going to demonstrate. Um, 
and uh, using different types of mark and improvising really. We work quickly and intuitively. We're using repetitive marks. And hopefully in the process, you'll start developing your own visual language. So sometimes you can actually recognize an artist's drawing by the types of lines they use. So think about Van Gogh and the swirling lines that he uses in skies. So hopefully we'll, you, you'll begin to develop your own visual language in the process. Okay, so I'm going to show you a video um, and we're going to start by showing you examples of black and white um, textural marks. And we'll take a second, just going to... Okay, so hopefully you can all see this and what I've got here is a simple cross hatch. So it's a series of parallel lines and they are just, um, I'm drawing in one direction and then I just simply move into another direction. Here's another way you can build up a texture. These are sort of starbursts or flower shapes working very quickly and intuitively and pressing quite hard in the center to create a kind of different tonalities in this texture. This is quite a sort of busy and kind of um, suggests fireworks um, kind of texture. So this is another texture, again, built up very simply by doing zigzag shapes. And here you can see that I'm using different uh, types of pressures. I'm pressing very lightly in some areas and in others very, very hard. So I'm creating a variety of tonalities. This involves using the side of your pencil and very quickly sort of like flicking your pencil off the surface of the paper. It's quite an angular and quite an energetic um, type of mark. So it could suggest uh, movement or um, certain type of feeling that when you're in a city. Here I've used two pencils. So you can see I've got two pencils and I'm just very, very kind of creating these flowing uh, figure of eight marks, um, not worrying too much about where my hand goes, allowing my hand to take me wherever uh, it wants to go, going over some areas to make them darker and others just sort of leaving them lighter. So it's up to you how far you go with that texture. And this last one, here I'm using both the side of the pencil and the tip. So the, the pointy, the, the sharp lines are created when I move the pencil up and the broader, fatter lines are when I'm using the side of the pencil and again, pressing quite hard to create these marks. So um, yeah, that's a variety of marks that you can uh, uh, take as a starting point, but please do improvise um, because um, we'd like you to kind of come up with your own, own types of marks um, as you build up these uh, text these textures. So you can see it's quite an embodied process. I'm using pressure, touch, and the movement of my body as I'm drawing. So the physicality of the drawing process can express your feelings and your moods. Um, and I was wondering, Rhiannon, whether there is also a connection between the physical and the psychological in your research. Yeah. Um... So I think when I tell people that I'm interested in how air pollution could affect mental health through being exposed to it, through breathing it in, people find that quite hard to imagine. I think it's kind of hard to imagine that something that you're physically exposed to that you ingest could affect you psychologically. Um, you know, I think we kind of think physical, um, physical factors affect our physical health and sort of social factors affect our mental health. Um, but you know, pollution, does affect every organ in the body, including the brain, it looks like. And we don't know exactly how that translates yet. Um, you know, we don't know exactly what pollutants have lead to what outcomes, but there are some pretty good studies. There was a, a recent study that was pretty robust and well conducted that came out recently. There was an article in The Guardian on Monday, which found a strong effect of air pollution on mental health in adults. Um, and yeah, I think because it, having a mind isn't a physical experience, Mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to imagine that that sort of thing could then translate into your psychological sort of world and experience. Um, but, you know, we're, we are made of what we what we breathe, what we eat. You know, we are part we are connected to our environments. And. Um, yeah, you know. 
it's important to recognize that I think that we are connected mm -hmm. and that they can definitely that it can have an effect as hard as it is to imagine um so do you think that art or drawing can be a way of kind of capturing those those interactions those physical and psychological links um, yeah, but so I think there's this sort of two things as a conscious and the sort of subconscious things going on when you're drawing. And so if you think about observational uh, drawing, that clearly reflects your sort of conscious responses to an environment. Um, and however, you're also moving your body as you draw and that can reflect how you feel. So um, like I think a mark can be sensitive. It can be soothing. It can be jarring. It can be aggressive. Um, and so mark making can allow that those all of those things to be expressed and some artists sometimes actively encourage this um, so for instance by drawing with your non-dominant hand which you have less control over or um, drawing with your eyes closed um, so you could try this uh, while you are making all of your different sort of mark making textures. Try some with your sort of non-dominant hand or with your eyes closed. Um, because sometimes, you know, when we're in a city and uh, there's a lot of sort of stress as a stress, stressful environment, uh, we can we often block them out, uh, but it can manifest itself and it's like tremor of your, in your hand, a tension in your jaw. So allow those movements to come through in your drawing um, and um, think about whether you're simply just moving your wrist as you draw or are you using your shoulder? Um, are you using your back? Are you shifting your weight in your seat as you draw? And experiment with this, try and exaggerate it. I often draw standing up because I love that way of drawing. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel as though it gives a different energy to a drawing when you're standing up. It's different to sitting down. Um, so, so you have, uh, some of you must have uh, started making black and white drawings now. Uh, and I wanted to show you some cut examples of working with color um, if you wanted to try this as well. So I'm going to share my screen. I'll be a second. Okay, so hopefully you can all see this. Um, so I've started here sort of thinking think about, so. sorry? I don't know if it has come up, it hasn't for me. But. Oh, okay. Let me just uh, escape. Um, okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Sorry about that, folks at uh, technology. Um, so this is a uh, green, uh, I was thinking about a green cityscape when I was creating this. Um, and uh, this is how I created this texture. So it is simply three different colors of felt tips, and I am just creating, uh, going, thinking about a leaf shape, uh, not, uh, not trying to control it too much, just allowing my hand to follow that kind of movement and flowing through the paper, going over some parts, allowing others to be lighter. Um, and you can see how very quickly you can build up um, a texture just by using that kind of process. This one is much more minimal. And I used, I was thinking about moss for some reason when I made this and I am working much more vertically here with the pens and drawing a, a sort of figure of nine or a figure of six so a loop followed by a little tail and think about making some of your textures darker and some of them this one is quite a light texture it has a lot of white paper showing through so make some of them lighter so that you have a variety of densities when you come to make your final collage because it's nice to have that 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 variety uh, and that choice when you're cutting out your shapes so that's uh so it could be they could be little pebbles as well so it's just it's a very abstract shape and um, this one is much more uh, frenetic uh, it's much uh, sort of angrier movement i've used hot colors pinks uh, and purples and i am moving my hand in a very kind of um angular triangular jerky kind of movement um, and um, just going in lots and lots of different directions, um, going over marks I've already made, so some of it will be darker. And um, you can even change your pencils halfway through if you wanted to, so you have different colors. So this I think of as my smog 
texture. <laughs> I think of it as card fumes. And so I've got um, black and blues and purples. Those are the three colors I've chosen. And literally I'm just swirling, sort of going looping um, through the paper as I, as I um, create these textures. It's uh, very, very fast very very intuitive and um quite there's something quite sort of um calming and meditative about repeating a mark i find there's something sort of lovely and relaxing about um mm -hmm. um just repeating movements and this is um, another loop i think of this one as water and um, but it's a, an elongated shape so rather than circles i'm making more of a kind of um oval shape with this one um, but again, just 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 slow, just follow that kind of movement rhythmically, uh, and see what happens. Just allow yourself to be surprised at the kinds of marks you make. So hopefully, that's given you some ideas about um, the kinds of textures that you can make. Um, and um, please do send us your drawings via Twitter. You can use the hashtag Imperial Lates. Or you can, if you don't have Twitter, you can email us on late at imperial.ac.uk. And by the end of this workshop, we'll create a gallery so you can see all those sort of lovely collages and drawings. Um, you can also, if you've got any questions for Rhiannon or for myself, um, you can use the YouTube chat to post them and we'll, we'll, we'll answer them um, uh, probably towards the end of this workshop. Okay, so um, so there was that lovely sort of, I was thinking about the lovely green leafy marks that I was making. Um, and I was wondering, Rhiannon, how changes to our environment, sort of both negative and positive impact upon mental health? You know, did we see, particularly during lockdown, evidence of these changes? I was thinking like there was, early on, there was very, there was much less traffic on the roads. Yeah. Um... So I think obviously a ch if the environment affects your mental health, then a change in the environment can affect your mental health. Um, a lot of people who have mental health conditions are also, you know, afraid of going outside. Um, I think, and I think for anyone, you know, going to an unfamiliar place might be quite nerve wracking. I think a lot of it comes down to a sense of control and expectation and how much you feel you can anticipate. Um, with regard to COVID, I think there were some positive things. Some people, um, you know, were spending more time in green space. They were going on more walks. And I think some people found that a real solace. Um, and obviously there was things like pollution going down. Um, there were animals being found in places that weren't found before. Yeah. Um, but I think there was also some negative things. I think um, people, I've had people say, you know, when they live in a very densely populated area, um, then kind of being confined to that area into their home was quite stressful. And similarly, when you have large families and small apartments, like trying to find a place to work, and trying to find a bit of peace, I think was quite difficult for some people. Um, and of course, I think, you know, the nature of, of these kind of restrictions, it's about your environment, it's where you're allowed to be, doing what and who with. Um, and I think it has made people more aware of how, you know, their environments affect their mental health and well-being. There is a lot of research going on at the moment and there have already been some things coming out. Um, interestingly, one study said that young, a lot of young people's mental health had actually gotten better because they weren't so stressed by school and social situations. But there's also been a lot of loneliness and isolation and people struggling with that. Um, as I say, it remains to be seen the mental health impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated public health measures. But I, I would be surprised if there, if there hasn't been, if there hasn't been one. And there's research going on at the moment looking into that. Um, in terms of pollution, have you done any artwork on on pollution or or, or water pollution, those sorts of things? Yes, um, I have. I was thinking about that because there is a lovely connection between your research and some projects that I've worked on in the past. So I um, I have made artwork in response to air pollution in Greater Manchester. So um, I'm interested in mapping, as I mentioned earlier, and um, this was in uh, response to um, data maps, really, about air pollution sites and levels in Greater Manchester. And it was shown, as you can see here, on um, a train station. So there 
did a series of five drawings um, and it seemed quite apt to show them on a train station because car pollution and cars are implicated in um, air pollution. Um, and so the drawings were very much about, I was thinking about them as merging the internal body with the external environment. So they merge microscopic images of the internal body and thinking about the fact that our bodies are permeable and the city enters our bodies through our lungs, but also through our skin, through our um, ears. You know, it's, we're very much, we create these environments and then we're in, affected by them in, in, in return. So this drawing, this is a detail, is from a microscopic uh, image of lung tissue uh, it's oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. And you can see the kind of swirling lines at the bottom right hand corner. And they are taken directly from um, the motorway ring road around Manchester. And this next drawing is taken from um, a mast cell. So uh, it's a microscopic image of a mast cell, which is um, uh, implicated in, it, it produces histamine and it's implicated in asthma. And all the colored dots around it are um, taken from a map of air pollution sites in Greater Manchester. So yeah, so I was just merging both of those things, internal and external. And I've just seen, there's a fantastic comment from Hamida. Um, so she says, I think art allows you to express yourself without caring what anyone else thinks. That's, that's wonderful. That's a great, that's a very insightful and, and, and I think you're right. I think you know, when, when I'm making, when I'm absorbed and lost in the middle of a drawing, it gives you a freedom. It gives you, you know, you, you don't worry about because what anyone else thinks, you're just expressing yourself. And I think in that sense, it can be very good making, being creative for your mental health um, because it takes that pressure away of constantly worrying about what others are thinking. Mm. Yeah, that's, thank you for that, Hamida. Um, and the next, oh yes, and I wanted to show you one last project, which was um, at the Horniman Museum in London. And this one was about water pollution. And that large map that you can see is actually based upon satellite imagery of the Bangladesh region in South Asia. But what I did was I manipulated the colors and changed them to reflect research into the typical colors that are the traditional textiles of the region. And the reason I did that was because I was thinking about nature and culture. And the fact that when we destroy nature, we're also, in a sense, destroying the fabric of culture. Mm. So hidden within this map are these sort of tiny drawings of, so we did some research and found out what, which species were at risk because of water pollution. And they're mm. kind, of, kind of embedded in the map, so you have to look for them very carefully. So they're literally disappearing off the surface of that landscape, in a sense. And alongside the map, I made a series of pots um, again, based upon research into traditional water carrying pots that they take to, from the well to the home. And I inscribed the surface of those pots with drawings of pathogens and chemicals, water pollutants in, you know, from industries such as the textiles industries found in the rivers. So yeah, yeah, it's interesting, but there's definitely a link between um, our two kind of practices, um, mine and yours, Rhiannon. But that work was about the impact of pollution on the human body. But from what you're saying, there's also a mental health impact uh, in relation to pollution. And I was wondering if anxiety about the environmental crisis can be dangerous for our mental health, particularly for young people, for the younger generation? Yeah, so um, my fo the focus of my research is more, or my PhD research is more on the local environment and influences there. Um, but there is a, I'm sort of peripherally involved in a project called Climate Cares, which is looking at, um, I think we're gonna put a link up, but um, is looking at the effects of climate change on people's mental health. Um, and of course, it could affect it, in, it directly if you're exposed to sort of a natural disaster. But perhaps in the UK, it might be more anxiety about the future. Um, and I think talking to young people, um, I think a lot of young people are very environmentally engaged, but also feel very afraid. You know, they, they anticipate seeing effects in their lifetime and they feel like they've kind of been burdened with this problem by older generations who aren't taking it seriously enough. Um, I think a lot of them feel quite powerless um, and a lot of them do feel quite scared. So 
they say it's um there's just research starting to come out now on sort of measuring the extent of this um and the impact of it you know is it um how how many young people does this affect etc um but you know i think it's not just young people it's scary for everyone and i think we all feel a bit powerless we can sort of see this thing happening and see that it's not good but it requires a communal solution and one person can't really do that much um mm -hmm. i often feel guilty as well because it's so hard to live 100 percent sustainably in our society so i think that it can i think that climate change and the sort of the global ecological crisis can be related to a lot of negative emotions and of course there's people who are being directly affected now um, in their, in their, you know, with natural disasters and droughts and things like that, who are, whose mental health could be affected as well. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think it is scary um, because it's just this, this slow change, and and people don't feel like there's anything they can do to stop it. Mm. Um, what do you, what is the role of change in the unexpected in art and in the creative process? Do you think? Ah, okay. So that's that's quite different, really, uh, in in the sense that um, I think the unexpected and the unknown can bring a freshness and a vitality to drawings. So controlled drawings can sometimes look a bit flat and dead. Mm. Um, and so uh, I suppose our attitude towards lack of control can determine whether it's perceived as exciting or as threatening. Um, so changes you know, can be positive or it can be negative. And artists often talk about taking risks when they're making work. Um, it's something that they actually kind of invite. Um, and then we will talk about happy accidents. So the unexpected happens in the middle of a process and you recognize the potential in that and then you use it. So even though it's a bit uncomfortable, um, it's something that's welcomed. Um, yeah, they're very different. <laughs> so, yeah, negative. yeah. So hopefully by now, all of you will have generated quite a few different textures and marks. Uh, oh, let's see. Let's see what you've done. <laughs> Got a few here. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, it's quite a quick process, isn't it, Rihanna? And you get kind I'm of. I've got five full sheets of art already. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. So. Please do send us your uh, your drawings that you made so far again using hashtag Imperial Lates or email to lates at imperial.ac.uk. Uh, any questions? Use the YouTube chat, and uh, you know we'd love to hear what you what what do you think as well. Use that. Um, so the next stage is to cut out shapes for your collage. So I'm going to show you that now, um, and um, share my screen. So bear with me. Whoops, not stop screen. Um, share screen, there we go. Right, can you see this, Rhiannon? Yes, I can. Excellent. Okay, so here is a texture I made earlier, as they say, and this is the process that you go through. So you take your sheet of paper and you turn it upside down. And on the back of it, you can start drawing your shapes. So if I was doing an autumnal leaf scape, I would just do lots and lots of different leaf drawings, do them quite loosely, don't worry about getting them perfect, because remember, you're going to be collaging these and layering them on top of each other, so it's not as though we are going to see one individual shape on its own against a white background, um, it's going to be part of a much bigger kind of composition, so there you go, we have one leaf scape, one leaf shape. Um, and so if, for instance, you were working in black and white, say that was your, um, that was your texture and you wanted to do um, a cityscape, then just very loosely, you can create a building shape. You really don't need to worry about using a ruler and getting it exactly square because actually I think having um, a freer, drawing creates a more interesting collage and it will be quite angular and um, you're layering things in uh, diagonals on top of each other so you want there to be kind of movement in in the collage and for it not to be kind of rigid by being sort of totally straight and squared off 
So there you go. There's one. There's another building shape. Um, if you really want to make a symmetrical building, this is how you do it. So if I've got one, I've got a texture there, I fold it in half at the back. And then on the back, I'm drawing half of the building. Um, so here it's a big building and um, I've created a large pitched roof and I've also done a doorway on this one. So on this one, I'm gonna be cutting out uh, the doorway so that you can get a sense um, uh, of, of an entrance to the building. Um, I think you'll struggle with windows, but doorways you can do. Um, and um, yeah, just simply cut it out. And then I open it and there it is. You have another, another piece of your collage that you can use to create your final piece. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, oh, I'm gonna do one more. This one is of um, a tower, a, 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 a sort of skyscraper. I'm thinking of this as a building in New York uh, because it's got, it's very tall and it's got a tall, as a spire shape at the top. Um, so, um, oh yeah, and do vary the sizes of your buildings. Don't make them all the same um, because that will give variety to your collage. So do some smaller shapes, smaller buildings and do some bigger ones so that you've got contrast when you make your final collage. So there you go. That's um, a skyscraper in New York. Okay, so, so stop screen and I am back. <laughs> So I hope you found that helpful. Um, and the next stage, so once you have uh, turned all your pieces of paper upside down, done lots of drawings of leaves or of buildings and cut them out, is that you will start assembling your collage. Now, what I suggest you do is when you start doing that, don't, don't use your glue or your tape straight away, but simply put everything on a sheet of paper and start moving them around. This is the fun bit. This is the bit where you can really play with it and you can do lots and lots of different variations if you don't stick them straight away and take a photograph of, the, of your different variations as you move them around. So I'm going to show you just very quickly how that's done so you get an idea. Can you see this, Rhiannon? Can you see this, Rhiannon? Yes. Oh, cool. Okay. So here is um, one I did earlier, and it's lots and lots of leaf shapes. So this is like an oasis. And I put them on my sheet of paper, and I'm just literally moving them around, trying to figure out where I want the different colors to go, thinking possibly about a foreground and a background. And um, you can see how the different textures that I make quickly kind of give a sense of a, a beautiful sort of green, green landscape, you know, with different uh, shapes of leaves and different textures. Um, and there you go. So that's that's just uh, that's one version, but you could do two or three, take photographs of them and do send them to us because that would be great to see. Okay, so I am back. Um, so I hope you found that uh, helpful. Do ask us any questions using the chat function if you're not sure what to do. Um, and remember to post on Twitter uh, or email us those images. But that was a lovely green uh, sort of oasis. Um, and I was wondering actually, how important are those kinds of green spaces in the city, Rhiannon? Um, so there is a lot of research on this um, that suggests that green space could be very um, good for your mental health. And it's thought that there are sort of a variety of mechanisms. So um, being in a green natural space can make you feel just very calm, has a soothing effect. Um, but also people might be more inclined to go out for physical activity um, and to get fresh air. You know, green space also cleans the air, so you have cleaner air and it also creates can create a sort of barrier for noise. So it prevents the spread of so much traffic noise in urban areas. Um, so it has has a lot of benefits to people's health, people's mental health and their physical health. Um, but it's important to remember that some people have more access to green spaces than others, um, and some people's environments are, you know, cleaner and more peaceful. Um, and some people have more choice over where they live. Um, and you know, when it comes to sort of socioeconomic 
um, differences, there are people, well, there are these inequalities in health already. And, th and I think the, the fact that some people are in, in environments that are less beneficial for your health and mental health kind of perpetuates those inequalities, um, which gives us even more reason to want to address that um, and to you know, create more peaceful, more green spaces, more oases in the city, because it would be beneficial for people and planet and kind of and address that because some of us can choose where we want to be and where we want to live and what we want access to and, and some of us can't. Um, so I think that's a quite important, you can tell people to go and get green space, but if there isn't any for miles around and you don't have a car then, you know. Yes, and I was very aware of that during lockdown. So there were times where um, I just knew I had to get out into a green space, whether it was, you know, just a local park or, you know, there's a river quite close to where I live, so just walk along the river. I did also notice that the green spaces were used so much more than ever before. Like they were crowded in a way that I've never seen them. So there were a lot of people feeling the same way. Um, and in a sense, you were going into a green space for that kind of um, escape, but also it would bring other pressures because there were so many people there. So maybe as a society, we need to think about how much green space is available to people to clean cities because um, if everyone starts using them then they suddenly become quite small yes mm -hmm. I noticed that um so I wonder if anyone has and um, posted any pictures or um, if anyone has any further questions about myself or Rihanna um, it would be I, it's quite a it's quite a complicated um, process to go through. So maybe some of you are still busy drawing. I'd love to see if you've managed to kind of get, uh, cut out any shapes yet, Rhiannon, and uh, yeah. if you've managed to hold, if you've set, in, oh, great. Okay, so <laughs> let's see. What I was thinking about was, you know, it's we've talked a lot about, you know, the city being negative and like the green space being so good, but, um, you know, I actually love the city and I love London. Um, oh. and, so it's kind of capturing, yes, the sort of vibrancy and, and yes, the noise, but also like the kind of excitement of being around lots of lots of people and and lots of different things to do and lots of different cultures and kind of that kind of more positive side to a city environment. Um, and, you know, a city can have all those things and still be clean. Um, so, yes, and I think a city can be very uh, can be a very beautiful and calm space as well. And if I think of London, you know, some of the architecture is stunning and it often has um, enough space that you can see a lot of sky. You know, somehow that's quite important to me to be able to see sky and by the river. There's a lot. It feels open, you know, by the Thames, even though, you know, it is a centre of London. Um, so, yes, I think I think you know, and particularly during lockdown, I imagine it was very, very quiet in the centre of London. There wasn't probably very little traffic, not many people. I kept thinking that's a perfect time to go and wander around the centre of London because usually it's so crowded, you know. Yeah, I did experience that at one point. I went in to meet a friend and um, socially distance, of course, but it was, we were in a sort of central London with these big sort of buildings, but it was completely, completely deserted. And it was, it was very soothing and kind of beautiful in its own way. Um, I think I saw a comment come up um, which said someone said that they were doing it in a group and they were finding it very soothing which sort of appeared on screen so that's good to hear I'm oh. definitely feeling very calm and relaxed and there's a lovely second comment from Hamida so thank you for that Hamida and, it, and, um, and um, she says whenever I feel down I like to stay alone in my room and listen to music I think of it as my safe space away from whatever issues that I feel burdened by. And that's that's also very, very true. Yes, I have um, my safe space was doing yoga in my front room. And, and, some, I, and I, I don't usually practice, but during lockdown, I just made that the something I did every morning. Mm -hmm. And it made a huge difference, that sort of, sort of quiet, uh, reflective, Sort of space where you're just you know again using your body but also actually that's affecting your mind mm. those movements are having a huge impact upon your mental well-being as well yeah again it's those connections and um you know your room is still your environment um mm. it's everything around you i definitely 
never really went for many walks or really appreciated um, nature that much before lockdown. I sort of did in theory, but I didn't really make it, make time for it. But um, going for walks in the forest or runs in the forest particularly, I found just so, especially sort of looking up and seeing like the sky with the trees, I found that to be so, so calming and, and so sort of exciting as well to kind of feel, you know, this is life and this is something that we're part of. Um, and there's some, I think even something as simple as having plants, instead of growing plants in the house. So I quite got into my, you know, plants that are often neglected <laughs> were, were loved suddenly, you know, and, um, you know, things like just that, it's just noticing something that's growing, you know, because it's live and uh, a new leaf has very different colors and textures to one that's you know it's an older leaf so you can you kind of notice those things a lot more and in a sense that's what artists do as well very much it's about noticing things that maybe other people don't notice um yeah and in your sort of in your career as an artist, what kind of brought you to be interested in um, in the environment and in science as a mm -hmm. subject matter? Well, I think early on when I was uh, at art school, I this the uh, human body was my subject matter. It always has been my subject matter. Um, and I found that over time I started looking closer and closer. And so I was using a macro lens, which allows you to get intense close-ups of the surface of the skin um, to the point where the photographs almost looked like landscapes. And then it just seemed a natural progression to kind of go into the body. Um, and I became very interested in, when I was doing my master's in um, scientific sort of images of the internal body. And also that sort of, there's a lot of writing about something called the scientific gaze, uh, mm. which um, sort of equates looking with knowing. So those kinds of ideas sort of, I was very much absorbed by. Um, and then I was quite lucky um, early on to get residencies in uh, scientific institutions. So I had one in a radiology department and then one in a medical imaging um, sort of department in a, at Manchester University. Um, so you can't make that kind of work without access to those kinds of people with expertise and technologies and the images that they can make. Um, and they, I found them very inspiring. And to be honest, artists have always been, I don't see it as any different to the fact that artists find inspiration in the world around them. It's just a different place to look at for images. But, you know, to me, you know, scientific images of the body are as fascinating as, as drawn ones. Mm. And what about you? How did you get into your type of research into the environment? Um, so I've always been interested in, in mental health. That was my uh, initial interest. So my undergraduate degree was in psychology and philosophy. So I've kind of always towed that line between kind of arts and science. Um, I've been interested in, the, in that interaction. Um, so sort of looking at mental health and human experience from like sort of two, approach, two lenses. Um, sort of the scientific and the sort of analytical. But I did my master's in young people's mental health, so still kind of very focused on mental health. But I've always been interested in the environment and environmental issues in more of a, from more of a lay perspective. Um, but I, yeah, I came across this project. Um, I was, I applied to look at mental health in the cohort study, in the SCAMP study. And there's lots of data on, on pollution. I thought, actually, that's really interesting and, and I think it's something that needs to be understood better and and it's something that I want to know more about and to help contribute to our understanding of because you know we're already doing a lot of harm to the environment but if it's affecting our mental health as well as physical health and that's a whole another reason to, to make a change. But there's a lot of there's a lot of talk in the media about sort of like the environment and young people. And um, what do you feel about the media's reaction to all of that? Because um, a lot of it is it's it's mixed. It's sometimes quite negative, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I think that you know there's a lot of climate activism, especially people even younger than me, so like teenagers, who are, who are extremely passionate about this. And I think I think. 
you know, if you look at it historically, people have always kind of, um, young people have often been blamed for things or kind of that what they were interested in or passionate about has been kind of dismissed. Um, but, you know, they have a voice and they're growing up into this world and this is something that they really care about and they're the ones that have to have to deal with it. And I think it's so inspiring how they are kind of making their voices heard and taking this so seriously. Um, you know, I think, for example, with a lot, there was a lot of blame on young people for um, transmission of COVID-19, for example, a lot of people saying, oh, it's young people going out and getting together. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I don't know why that is, but I think that they're, they're not just being, I think, I think they're being sort of portrayed as just being like creating a problem out of nothing or looking for something to complain about. But I think that it's really inspiring how passionate that generation is and how much they're trying to change something which they which they don't want to be the case for the world they're growing up into. Mm. Is there anything do you think we can do as a society to to listen to their voices better? Um, because they are they're they're um, addressing really important issues that um, often you know, they, they just get buried, don't they? We, we kind of, it erupts and then it gets buried and nothing changes, nothing is done or it feels that way. Um, I think that, you know, on both the local and the sort of national and the global level, we could be getting more young people in the room with decision makers and policy makers. They could be listening to their concerns and their ideas um, because maybe they can't vote yet. Maybe they're not in positions of power and influence, but they can take their we can take their voices seriously just because you're young doesn't mean that you haven't got important things to say and at the end of the day they're the ones inheriting the world that we're that we're building now yeah 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 well i hope all um that your collages are coming along uh well now i'm some of you might still be cutting out your shapes and putting them together do do post them uh, we would love to see uh, some images. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you haven't stuck them down. You can take a photograph as you're just uh, assembling them um, and try different versions and take a picture of each different kind of composition. It would be great to see um, what you've done up to now. Uh, and um, don't worry if they kind of don't look representational because this is abstract drawing so in a sense you are creating an abstract image which suggests that what it feels like to be in a certain environment you're not doing a representational uh, image of buildings in a city or a cityscape or even of a park but a suggestion of what it feels like so somebody has said, um, oh, there's another comment saying, my drawing right now is a random blur of colours, uh, which is fine. You can, you know, that's that's absolutely yeah, fine. We'd love to see yeah, that. Isn't it, to embody how you're feeling right now, mm -hmm. how you're feeling in a certain space. So, um, yeah. And I've said the... Um, I love I love I love working with young people. I sort of often do workshops uh, with uh, I've worked with school groups from sort of primary age. They're fantastic to work with because they're so open and um, they're just not afraid. It's interesting because there comes a stage in um, development. It seems to me, anyways. Uh, I think it's about twelve when suddenly uh, sort of. Uh, children who will draw anything and are not afraid of a piece of paper will suddenly say, I can't draw and be afraid of this sort of big piece. But actually, I don't know where it comes from. It must come from society, it must be learned. Um, because I think- yeah, yeah, yeah. We seem to think that you shouldn't, if you're not like good at art in a particular way, you know, whatever that means, as if that's a thing to be good in a particular way, in a prescribed way. But I think we have this idea that you shouldn't be making art if, if you're not good at it, or if you can't sort of make money out of it. Um, but you know, creative activities and hobbies aren't, they're not just for that purpose. Um, and it is a shame that people kind of get to an age where they're like, oh, I can't sing or I can't draw and they just, and they stop. Yeah. Um, it's not just art, it's, it's, it's all the art forms, isn't it? It's like, I can't sing or I can't do a sculpture or, yes, yeah, yeah. so I can't play. It's, it's for everyone. <laughs> And that's actually, so this is really important, I think, is because actually creativity and making art isn't, for me anyways, and I think a lot of artists would say this, is not about the end product. It's about the journey. It's about, you know, what you experience and, and how you learn and, and how it opens you up. 
to different things while you're in the middle of making it. So if you kind of focus on the end product and say, oh, well, I can't do it, and then lots of young people are missing out on that experience, which is actually or could be quite therapeutic. Mm. Yeah. Do you know anything about art therapy or have you ever, um, have you any experience of it? I know you're not an art therapist, but I was wondering about your thoughts on, on art therapy as a... Oh, that, I guess I'm not a trained, I'm, I, I've not worked as an uh, art therapist and I don't go into uh, situations sort of in approach, approach them as an art therapist or deliberately go in there thinking, well, this is going to make you feel better. But I do very much believe that, um, well, I've seen it so many times. It's not just my experience, but I've seen it during workshops that actually bringing people together while they're making and doing and engrossed in materials, materials are really important, is incredibly powerful. And I think a lot of people have learned that in lockdown. You know, I think I, I, so many people I know sort of started crafting and it really doesn't matter what you do. It's just it's just to, to lose yourself and engross yourself in that way is very, very powerful. Yeah, there's, um, it's a state of being that sort of called being in flow, which there's been sort of it's in positive psychology, a concept that sort of is thought to contribute to well-being. And it's when you're able to get into that, maybe it's not creating up exactly, but it could be in a bunch of different situations, but it's when you're able to get into that state of mind where you're present in what you're doing and in the now, which is meant, meant to be really, really good for you. Um, I definitely yeah. used to have that where I would write and not really think about what I was writing, but just kind of get into this kind of flow of just letting my thoughts come out on a page. And I always found that really, really useful. Yes, but I think that that's creative too. It's it's a, just a different process, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say to uh, everyone that um, if you're still kind of making your collages and you feel like and then it's not quite ready, you don't want to post it yet, please do post it afterwards. That's fine. We'd love to see it when it's finished, yeah. when you feel ready to show it. Um, so don't worry if you don't want to, you know, you feel like, well, I haven't quite cut out all my shapes yet. Uh, that's fine as well. Um, and there's, um, oh, there's an interesting comment here from Pamela. Is it Pamela or Pamela? It's Pamela. Um, about um, young people and sort of so the conflict possibly between young people and older people. So obviously, um, it's the older generation that have historically created this kind of mess with the environment and all kinds of sort of, uh, you know, this species extinction, biodiversity, all of those things that young people are really worried about. So what mm -hmm. kind of conversations do you think um, that, Rhiannon, that, you know, people need to have maybe with their young people, with their children? Mm -hmm. How do you frame it? Because they are anxious and they are angry possibly as well. Yeah, I think I think anger is one of the reactions that people can have. Um, it's not necessarily directed at older people in general. It might be specifically, you know, people in power um, or it might be, you know, if they feel like they have older generations of their family who don't take it seriously or don't or, don't even, or maybe don't believe in climate change, for example. Um, but not every young person feels that way. You know, there's all these different responses. There are young people that aren't particularly interested or, or bothered or maybe they just don't. It's, it's not it's not a big fa feature of their lives, but you know, all emotional responses are valid and we're only just beginning to unpack um, how people could respond to this kind of situation because there's not really a comparable situation that, that we've faced before. Um, so yeah, I think the important thing is when talking to young people about this is to give them a space to talk and express those feelings, you know, be it anger, be it, be it worry, be it sadness, um, just listen and give them a space to talk. Um, mm. and to express that and to feel like that's valid and they're not being silly, they're not being dramatic. Mm. Um, and then secondly, I think, you know, talking about ways in which they might perhaps be able to make themselves feel a bit better. I know a lot of young people find it really beneficial to get involved in environmental projects locally or to mm. get involved in activism on a more sort of political level um, or just to make more, more um, sustainable choices in their own lives. I think for a lot of people, a lot of young people speak about a journey from being kind of paralyzed with anxiety to feeling kind of um, empowered and positive and hopeful because they feel like they're able to make a difference. And, you know, everyone can say, I, you know, I'm one person, what difference can I make? But um, 
people add up don't they and any change is brought about by a collective group of people who have decided they can mm. yeah yeah oh we've had a i don't know if everyone saw that but we've had a lovely comment from angela which she said i started drawing some of my plans at the imperial lates workshop and i've never felt so relaxed since taking up drawing so she says i was one of the person people that said i'm not good at drawing but i love it so that's great that's lovely to hear um angela thank you for that um and yeah. for that. post it on twitter if we okay. could share that on screen that'd be awesome so this is a piece of art oh great great fantastic oh wow i love it i like the red background as well it's a sort of angry red sky and you often do get red skies don't you mm -hmm. um and i like the use of black paper as well that's lovely mm -hmm. uh, that um that curved texture is fantastic um yeah. it reminds me almost of like a graphic novel or sort of a yes sort of yes yes it could be couldn't it it could be a or, or, or a zine it could be a cover of a zine it's very graphic isn't it mm. yeah very strong colors thank you for that thank you very much yeah we'd love to see more guys post some if you want mm -hmm. and i'd love to see yours as well rianne and have you got oh you can hold up more shapes Oh, oh. <laughs> excellent! But, <laughs> it's kind oh, of right. and loud, but it's you know it's positive. Um, it's vibrant. I think that's kind of what the city means to me ultimately, despite it's uh, have risk posing some risks to our health and mental health as well. Yes, I feel the same actually. Mm -hmm. I love I love London. It's a, such a wonderful city, and I actually mm -hmm. I think what's lovely about it is walking around it. Mm. It's one of those places you could just lose yourself and find different streets and see mm. different places and you could just spend such a long time. Just It's quite an experience just walking and there are so many different people and mm. uh, kind of, yeah, yeah, it's a special place. Okay, so last, a last reminder to everyone that um, if you would like, please do send us your drawings via Twitter using mm. hashtag imperial lates or email it to lates at imperial.ac.uk you can do it after this workshop that's absolutely fine we would love to really love to see them and i look forward to seeing them as well and i'm going to be handing over to um emma soon um but um I think also that you know once we have lots of images we'll be putting up a gallery a link to a gallery so that that you can all see see what everyone else has made as well so that would be great so um yes whenever you're ready emma to um say your final goodbyes that would be great. <laughs> thank you everyone thank you thank you for joining us thank you so much for that that was brilliant i've been trying to scribble uh, I don't know if anyone wants to see this or can see this, but this is my little bit. I haven't cut it out, but I've done a little bit with a piece of scrap paper of texture. Um, so thank you so, so much for that. That was absolutely brilliant. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think we've had lots of lovely comments. People have really enjoyed creating, even if people don't necessarily feel like they're artists. Uh, I think they've had a, a nice time. So thank you so much. Um, please, again, feel free to share uh, your drawings later on this evening, or if you even want to work on them the rest of the week, uh, and then post on social media using hashtag Imperial Lates, or email them to us uh, at lates at imperial.ac.uk. We'd love to see them. So before you go tonight, we would really love to love you to tell us what you thought about the event. So we're going to be posting a link to a short survey in the chat. And we'd really appreciate if you've got a couple of minutes just to fill it in. Uh, and if you want to check out the rest of the events that we've been doing this week, the recordings of what's been and gone already are all, all on our YouTube channel. And there's still time to sign up for tomorrow's Publis Quiz the health and fitness edition with our wonderful resident quiz master Maeve. So don't miss that if you've got a bit of time tomorrow evening. Um, so a big thank you again to our amazing speakers, Daksha and Rhiannon, uh, and to you guys at home for spending your time with us tonight and have a lovely, lovely rest of your evening. Mm -hmm.